And now I'm going to turn it over to Tom Griffiths, uh, who will do our first talk. Thanks, Josh. So uh, I think my job here is partly to make an argument for why it is that we want to scale cognitive science, what it is that we can do by scaling cognitive science. And in doing that, I'm going to talk about, I think, some of the things that I think are really important opportunities here, and then also give you a, a, a biased set of examples uh, of work that have been associated with my lab. Uh, and you're probably going to hear about some of these things later on in the day. So if you walk into a psychology lab 100 years ago, you'd see something like this. There's a bunch of people standing around. There's uh, a table which has on it uh, some instruments that are carefully designed for collecting information about human behavior. Uh, and there's somebody who's you know, sitting there in the chair who's a participant in the experiment. So this is actually Wilhelm Wundt's lab from the turn of the century. Uh, if you walk into a psychology lab today, you see something like this, right? So not necessarily something that's, that's all that different from the psychology lab that we would have had 100 years ago. Uh, but I think psychologists are starting to think about how to change the methods that we use for collecting data. So if you're running experiments online, a lot of people are starting to use crowdsourcing platforms like Amazon Mechanical Turk or Prolific Academic, which provides you with information uh, about a, a much larger group of participants and allows you to think about taking studies that we run in the lab and then turning them into online studies that allow us to collect data faster and potentially at larger scales. But I think even as that change is starting to influence the way that we do cognitive science, people are still not necessarily exploiting all of the opportunities that are provided by these technologies. And one way of thinking about that is just by you know, sort of doing a thought experiment, right? So the question is, should you run the same experiment online with 1,000 participants that you run in a lab with 100? Or if 1,000 isn't a big enough number to make you think about this differently, what if it's 10,000, what if it's 100,000? There's some point where rather than just using these technologies as a way of doing the same thing that we've been doing, but faster and more conveniently, we should think about using these technologies to do something different. And so I think that's the interesting question here is like, what is the thing that we should be doing differently? So, you know, we're, <laughs> in, uh, as cognitive scientists often grouped together with social scientists, uh, we can go and look at, you know, social scientists who thought about these kinds of questions about revolutionary change, right? So Karl Marx says at some point, merely quantitative differences go beyond, uh, beyond a certain point, pass into qualitative changes. And I kind of think that's the moment that we're in. It's one where there's this opportunity for a revolution in the way that we do the work that we do. Uh, and so I've written a, a manifesto appropriately uh, about you know, what the, the kinds of changes that might happen in cognitive science might look like. But I think the, the key points come down to a simple slogan that more data is different data and three kinds of arguments about what we should be doing differently as a consequence of having access to these kinds of technologies and the kinds of qualitative changes that we should be making in our field. And so these three points are, first of all, that we should be collecting more data. Second, that we should be running different kinds of experiments because we can get more data. And third, that we should be analyzing the results of those experiments differently. And so what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk is basically run through these three points and uh, explain a little more about what I mean and maybe give you some examples. So for the first of these, the idea that we should be collecting more data, this is really an argument that uh, we kind of have a, a, an opportunity that we haven't necessarily recognized, which is that for you know, the first time in the history of cognitive science, we now have a machine which can pretty efficiently turn dollars into data, right? So you know, that in some sense was always true. You could always run very large scale surveys and commission a company to do that for you, but that wasn't something that you could do quickly, conveniently, and in a way that was relatively cost effective. So, the availability of these technologies mean that now we have a machine where if we want more data, we can put money into that machine and then we can get more data out of it. And so now the question sort of turns into a kind of economic question about, like, you know, given that we have this mechanism for turning dollars into data, is it worth spending more dollars to get more data? And so my argument here is that, in fact, it's a really good idea to spend more dollars to get more data because if we are running underpowered experiments, if we're collecting limited amounts of data, doing things in the way that we're sort of used to doing things as behavioral scientists. We're in fact wasting money because we're paying people to sit down and analyze those data and to kind of come up with theories that are under constrained by the information that we have. 
And so, you know, if you kind of think about the economics of this, if you write a grant proposal as a behavioral scientist, in that grant proposal, the labor costs are probably going to be, you know, 90 plus percent of the costs that are associated with that. Uh, and the data collection costs are some small fraction of it. And so by turning up that dial, so we're collecting more data relative to labor costs, we're potentially reducing the time that we end up wasting trying to figure something out, right? There are many literatures where we kind of go back and forth and someone runs this study and someone runs this study and someone runs this study, where if we just run one big study at the start, we could have maybe figured things out with enough precision that we wouldn't need to spend all that time going back and forth and trying to sort of argue about things where we were under constrained by the data that we have. And so if you raise this to the highest moral level, really the argument here is that, you know, the time that we're wasting isn't just dollars, it's, it's human lives and human effort that's being directed towards not answering questions that we could potentially answer if we spent enough money to collect the data that we need to answer those questions. And if that sort of makes you sort of uncomfortable, the idea that maybe to do our science, we need to be, you know, collecting larger data sets and spending money on doing that, you can pretend that you're a cognitive neuroscientist. So, uh, in cognitive neuroscience, I think a thing happened where people realized that if you wanted to run a reasonably powered study, you needed to spend a certain amount of money on scanner hours. And the sort of norms got established in that field and people started writing grants and a big chunk of that grant would be the money that you needed to collect the data that you needed. And I think we're just not used to thinking about behavioral science in that kind of way. But I think you can make lots of arguments that, you know, being able to collect a scanner hours worth of human data on a platform like Mechanical Turk is something that could potentially give you enough insight that it's worth putting the dollars into it in the same way that cognitive neuroscientists have established norms where they just have an expectation about how much money they're going to need to spend on data in order to be able to do the research that they're going to do. So that's the first sort of moral argument is, first of all, you know, we should be collecting more data, but then as a consequence of being collecting more data, then that changes the way that we should think about the kinds of experiments that we're going to do. And so one way of kind of framing this is in terms of thinking about the traditional kind of experimental paradigm as what Newell called, you know, playing 20 questions with nature, right? Uh, something that he was extremely pessimistic about. The way that we standardly conceive of running our experiments is we have, say, two hypotheses that we want to contrast. We construct a cunning experimental design that allows us to differentiate the predictions of those two hypotheses. We run the experiment and we get back one bit which tells us which of those hypotheses better matches the results of our experiment. But taking that kind of approach is pretty constrained in terms of what it allows us to do in exploring the space of possible theories. And it's something which means that, you know, we're, we're sort of basically kind of taking this random walk around the space of experiments that we run where we're being guided by whatever the hypotheses are that we have at that particular moment. And so having more data means potentially getting more bits. Uh, and we want to think about where it is that we want to get those bits in order to best answer the questions that we're interested in. And so as a consequence of that, I think there are different kinds of designs that you can think about using for large scale experiments. So one example is using procedurally generated conditions. So rather than coming up with your two hypotheses, designing the experiment that contrasts those. Instead, because we can collect lots more data, because we're not constrained by having to ask just exactly the right question given the limited data that we have, you can test a whole range of conditions that are generated via some algorithm that you specify to generate sort of interesting cases, but in a way that's relatively atheoretic. Um, so as an example of this, uh, this is some work that you'll hear about later today from Josh Peterson. Uh, we did some experiments in decision making in the domain of risky choice, where you can think about a decision problem, where you're making a choice between two gambles that differ in their payoffs and probabilities as basically a point in a high dimensional space, right? Each of these payoff numbers and probabilities is a parameter of this decision problem. And so you have some point in this high dimensional space. You can think about the experiments that people have run as corresponding to those points in those spaces. And so uh, what we did was uh, instead of trying to carefully design the experiments that differentiate between say prospect theory and some alternative, what we did was just generate points in that space and then see what kinds of decisions people make. And so doing that, we generated 13,000 pairs of gambles. So two orders of magnitude more data than previous experiments that have explored risky choice uh, and then got people's choices for those problems. And out of that, you get this much more comprehensive picture of the decisions that people make throughout this space. And this is just sort of a visualization. Again, Josh will give you more details later today. 
of what uh, this space of decision problems looks like. But uh, the key point here is our, uh, the sort of classic experiments that have motivated theories like prospect theory are the red crosses. The largest previous data sets on decision-making are the blue dots. And then the data set that we collected is the black dots. And as a consequence of having that much more data, we're able to ask a different kind of question about theories where now we can comprehensively evaluate whole classes of theories in a way that allows us to kind of try and answer these questions of what kinds of constraints are involved in human decision making. Another thing we can do is run experiments with much more complex naturalistic stimuli, right? So if you've you know, read the psychology literature on subjects like categorization, these are the kinds of stimuli that are used in categorization experiments. This is a, a grating where it might vary in spatial frequency and the, the angle of the grating. So we have nice, simple stimuli with two simple underlying dimensions, gives you lots of precision for testing model predictions. There's only one problem, which is that when people are categorizing things, they're not normally categorizing things that look like this, they're categorizing things that look more like this, right? And so by being able to use these more naturalistic stimuli, you maybe get a more realistic and strong test of a model in a setting which is the kind of setting that originally motivated it. But the classic problem with this is that this space of stimuli is so huge that you couldn't necessarily measure behavior throughout that space. And so the fact that we're able to use much bigger samples gives us an opportunity to gain precision in understanding how it is that people engage with these kinds of stimuli in these much larger, more complex stimulus spaces. Uh, and Josh will also talk about some examples along those lines. Uh, another thing that you can do is uh, use dense sampling to fully estimate functions. So I'll give you an example of this. So uh, this example comes from um, uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect. So this is a famous effect where people tend to uh, overestimate their ability when they're low performers. So this is what the sort of standard Dunning-Kruger data set might look like. So uh, this is just showing uh, on the horizontal axis, the quartile of performance on a task, in this case, a logical reasoning task, and on the vertical axis, uh, the people's estimated score. And so the classic phenomenon here is that you can see in the lower quartiles of performance, people's estimate of their score is higher relative to their actual performance. And their actual performance here is shown by the dotted line, the data by these triangles. And so this kind of data set, uh, this sort of standard sort of you know, uh, analysis of these kinds of data reduces the data to this relatively you know, impoverished sampling of points along that line. And as a consequence, gives us very limited data about what's actually going on inside people's heads. So it's not enough data to be able to discriminate between a simple model that says maybe people are doing some kind of Bayesian inference about their ability and sort of regressing to their prior mean uh, versus them actually having some kind of metacognitive deficit such that lower performers are less good at being able to uh, evaluate their own performance. And so uh, Rachel Jansen, who's a, a student in my lab, ran uh, an experiment with 4,000 participants performing this kind of uh, logical reasoning task, which allowed us to much more densely sample this space. And so now we can get a much more complete picture of what this function looks like. And so here again, the blue triangles correspond to the data, but now we're showing this function across the entire range of people's scores, and then there are corresponding estimated scores. And when we do that, we can see that what we get is not a simple straight line, which is the basic prediction that comes out of a, a a, a Bayesian sort of regression to the mean hypothesis, but rather something that has this kind of curve in it, which is consistent with people having a, a, a metacognitive deficit. Uh, other kinds of things that we can do are run what we call massively multifactorial experiments, where you might pit many, many factors against one another, sort of rather than each lab having their own theory that sort of identifies some particular factor as being important and focusing on that factor, running an experiment where you manipulate all of the factors simultaneously. But more broadly, when we're trying to answer these kinds of questions, what we're interested in is uh, thinking about what's the best way that we can use human data to try and structure the information that we get back about the theories that we're interested in. And so our sort of slogan for this is, is maybe we should think about experiment design uh, in terms of algorithm design. Uh, and that's something that um, Jordan Suchel will, will talk about later on today as well. So this kind of experiment design as algorithm design perspective is something that informed the development of a platform that we call Dallinger, which basically you can think about as a system for doing programming with people. Uh, and what Dallinger does is interact with crowdsourcing services like Amazon Mechanical Turk 
and allow you to automatically schedule participants, run experiments, and issue reimbursement, and then build graphs of the decisions that people are making according to some pre-specified logic, which can allow you to, for example, arrange people's interactions into networks and then evaluate how information spreads through those networks. And so this lets you do synchronous, uh, so group experiments and asynchronous uh, experiments where you have information that's being pursued across generations, as well as experiments where we use algorithmic control structures like optimizing a design or estimating a model ideally. Uh, and most ambitiously, you can run what we call society scale behavioral simulations, uh, basically implementing things like agent-based models with people. And so using this kind of approach, you can do all sorts of ambitious experiments that are things that would be impossible to do in a physical laboratory. So things like looking at interactions between large groups of people, simulating processes of biological or cultural evolution, or looking at effects of uh, social transmission through networks on people's cognition. Um, and uh, Matt Hardy and Bill Thompson, I have a talk about that later on in this Cognitive Science Conference. The final point here is that we should be thinking about analyzing the results of these experiments differently too. So uh, in the context of these large scale data sets, thinking about standard sorts of you know, hypothesis testing uh, is something that makes even less sense, right? These are sort of paradigms that are built for answering binary questions. And the whole point here is to go beyond those kinds of binary questions and think about the form of entire functions, like the examples that I showed you. Think about maybe using models to articulate the structure of these kinds of data. But I think the biggest point is that as we get more data, what we're going to discover and what we've increasingly discovered in the kinds of experiments that we've been running is that the complexity of human behavior is greater than that of psychological theory, right? So as psychologists, we've lived in a world where we had limited data and as a consequence, we could only evaluate simple theories. And as we get more data, the complexity of the theories that we can consider increases and the kinds of systematic deviations from the simple theories that we've previously identified are gonna increase. And so one of the, the things that I think is really important as we begin to explore this new space is recalibrating what we think about as the content of theories and using disciplines like data science and machine learning as a source of tools that allow us to build new kinds of theoretical models that are gonna be informative for cognitive science. So uh, three conclusions, right? We should be collecting more data, we should be running different kinds of experiments, and we should be analyzing the results of those experiments differently. Thank you. So I think we have time for a question or two. Um, please again, remember to uh, use your um, hand raising function and then Tom can call on you. I'm not seeing any hands. Yeah, I'm not seeing any hands either. You can also use the chat if you have any questions. I know we're still getting um, used to this whole system. But in the meantime, um, so I don't see any questions, I will ask a question, which is, Tom, what do you think is the, um, uh, the, the most exciting sort of like low hanging fruit, right? Beyond what you're already doing in your own lab, what's the thing you wish somebody would do? Uh, I mean, I think the 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 kinds of things that um, I've been thinking about more are about maybe how is it that thinking about these kinds of tools changes not just the the kinds of questions that we ask, but the way in which we ask them. So rather than maybe like low hanging fruit here, I think the thing that we need to do is start figuring out good conventions for collaboratively designing and executing some of these large scale experiments. Um, I think it's it's similar to um, you know, like if you think about fields like physics that have these resources like telescopes and so on, they do decadal surveys, which are directed at trying to figure out what are the most important questions in their field, and then building collaborations that are targeting uh, understanding those kinds of things. And I think as we start to get the resources for doing more and more ambitious experiments, that's something that, you know, creates the, the opportunity to try and revisit those kinds of scientific conventions in our own field. So okay. I can now see three people who've asked questions. Yeah, um, can you go ahead and take the first one and then we'll probably have to move on to the next talk. So Carmen. Uh, 
uh, Carmen, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sorry. I was talking uh, without being muted. Sorry about that. I didn't realize that you had to mute me also. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. I was just wondering because, uh, well, I was saying that thank you for a great introduction, but uh, that all of this sounds like we're moving away from the, gener the generation of robust hypotheses. And that's one thing that we have to keep in mind that it's important. Uh, so yes, of course, the analyses are going to be different, but uh, the factor that plays a major role in uh, being able to differentiate between type one or two errors and actually this is the hypothesis. And also we need to make sure that we put the time of generating this uh, robust hypothesis also. So yeah, uh, it is a yeah, I mean, oh, go on. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I was just like, it's a trade-off that we're dealing with, with all these ex, uh, scaling and expansion and also um, got into the disciplinarity of uh, our field, in, case, in my case, language sciences also. But uh, yeah, so it's just a worry that I have for me, students and everyone here. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sympathetic to that, um, but I, I would also argue that um, we, uh, that there's a value to doing theory agnostic. Uh, research here um, in, a, in a way where, so for example, that first example I talked about in the context of decision-making, that's something which, um, you know, that there's been a lot of hypothesis-driven research. And I think the opportunity there is to do something which is agnostic to the hypotheses in a way that then you can create a data set, which is going to be useful for evaluating lots of hypotheses uh, in, in, in the, um, uh, you know, where you're not kind of saying, okay, we're going to create a data set that will only allow us to differentiate between these two things, but rather create a data set that'll be an enduring thing that will allow generations of researchers to continue to use that data set to answer the questions that they're interested in. Yeah, okay, so the explorative work. Yeah, yeah of course, it's a great tool for explorative work. Um, I also wanted, to, yeah, there was a question that came up on the chat that I think was a really good point, which is about um, uh, kind of like the extent to which these kinds of models are uh, inclusive, right? So I've been talking about you have to spend a lot of money on collecting data. I don't think that that's intended to be something which would make it kind of, you know, harder to access the resources that you need to do this kind of science. That's part of why I think emphasizing building these collaborative uh, organizations around, you know, thinking about doing definitive large scale uh, data collection efforts is something that's really important because that's explicitly an opportunity to think about inclusion. Okay, so um, thank you, Tom, very much. Um, 